Um, today, I want to welcome a longtime friend of our show, uh, Dr. Nick Turkle. He's the CEO of the Center for Health, Education, and Access, and he was a longtime president and CEO of Aurora Healthcare, and then advocate Aurora Healthcare, and now is doing some palliative care work uh, within the Advocate Aurora system as well. Um, and I think, you know, I think we should just kind of get started and let you, Nick, tell your own story, because I, I think it's a really interesting one, um, because you've worn so many hats uh, as a physician, educator, business person, all of those things. Um, so I think for the, the group, it's helpful for us to learn a little bit about your, your path to palliative care since you, you have had an interesting long path. And I guess I should say you trained in family medicine, correct? That's right. Yeah. I, I trained in family medicine and later uh, did my CAQ in geriatrics. So focused much of my efforts through the years on, on elderly patients. My journey though to, to palliative care um, goes back a long way. Um, my experience in medical school around patients who were dying or in the dying process was, was not particularly good. It seemed that the residents and attendings began to back away pretty dramatically as people approached the end of life. And it, it seemed to be a very lonely experience. I would say as a family medicine resident, I had some really wonderful faculty who took a different approach and leaned in when people were at the end of life. That was a very important experience. But I would say the thing that got me most interested in palliative care and end of life care is a patient I took care of when I first came to Milwaukee, which was many years ago. And this patient was a 43 year old who presented to me as a new patient with jaundice. She turned out to have um, fairly advanced duodenal adenocarcinoma which is extremely rare in a 43 year old. I, I think she died at 43, maybe she was 40 when I first met her. And taking care of her through the process, getting to know her really well, listening to her, um, being at her home, doing a home visit when she passed away, um, had a big impact on me. And from there, I kind of launched into working as a UW faculty on developing a curriculum for medical students on end of life care and death and dying before palliative care was really a specialty. But I enjoyed teaching that. I enjoyed talking to um, students about things like, do you go to a patient's funeral or not? And, and getting them thinking a little differently about things. Along with that, I had some very personal experiences that absolutely affected my interest or level of interest in palliative care. My brother passed away of a um, brain tumor at age 32. It was a tremendous loss and watched him go through a process in a different state that was, could have been more ideal. And I would, I would say those kind of things that are close to your heart, your family, have just a huge impact on you. And then I, the last thing that I, I mentioned is when I was 30 years old, I developed um, myocarditis from Coxsackie that I caught from a patient. And I was in ICU with congestive failure and almost passed away. And I think that gave me a real view of what it's like to have be lying in a hospital bed and wondering if you're going to survive or not. So that's it's a, probably more than you, you wanted to hear, but it was a, a long journey. And when we, uh, 15 years ago, when we established Zilber as a hospice, my hope at the time, I was still clinically active in geriatrics at the time, but my hope was always that when I retired, I would have an opportunity to work there because I, I thought it was such a fantastic environment. Wow. That's, and, and you, you got to that goal. I did. Yeah. So, and that is always really interesting to me, you know, going from administration kind of back to your roots. How does that feel? Is it, are you, is it different than you anticipated? Is it, what's that you know, like? I, I just consider myself so fortunate. Like 
I had an opportunity for years to look at the really big picture. How do we care for a large population of people? Uh, and that was exciting. What we did in quality, what we did for access for patients, it was great. But now the things I'm working on, both uh, what I do at Zilber and what I do in the Center for Health Education and Access really did go back to my roots of teaching and clinical care. And I would say, well, and I said this throughout, throughout my career, whatever my role was, but I do think we have a great privilege to be in people's lives at critical times. And to be experiencing that again on a very personal level, getting to know the team that does such an amazing job at Silver, that is a privilege and I'm loving it. It's actually my most rewarding clinical experience of my career. And, and I've had a lot of great experiences. So it feels really good. It feels good to be in a smaller place with sort of a contained role and know that I can go in the morning and hopefully make a difference for both the team and, and the patients and families we take care of. So I, I, I enjoy it very much. Feels great. Good. Well, and you bring up this interesting point of how everybody's personal experiences influences how you how you feel about this end of life stuff. And uh, it just resonated because I, I talk to patients and families about that. Like there's no right answer. So much of your life experience, personal or family or otherwise, may influence how you how you think about this, how you proceed with your decisions. And I think it's interesting that that's impacted your feelings about about work, you know, about the work you do too. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about some of the mentors you've had through the years or, you know, and, and I'm sure as a, as a mentor yourself, you know, talk about what, what are things that are important in a men mentor? I had, um, I mean, we don't, we don't have time for me to talk about all the wonderful mentors I've had, but I've been really fortunate. Um, worked with a family physician uh, when I was a medical student. I did a, a month in a rural community that I later ended up practicing in, in Illinois. He was a wonderful mentor. And his, his mentorship was not around teaching me very much about the medical end of things, but teaching me how to meet patients where they are. So what you just referred to, Rose, the fact that people's experiences are all different. They come to you with um, a whole lot of baggage, if you will, and, and to be able to meet them where they are and listen to them and really get to know them as people allows you to provide better medical care. So this, this one physician in Illinois was really a wonderful mentor. Um, I had another mentor when I was a resident, uh, Bruce Van Cleve, who some of you know, he used to be the chief medical officer at Aurora. So he was my residency director when I was a second and third year resident. And ultimately we got to work together again as he finished his career. He was a great mentor around leadership and talking about why it's important to lead in whatever setting you're in. You know, not it doesn't have to be big, it can, doesn't have to be small, but figuring out how to know where you can apply leadership skills in any part of your life. He was a great mentor on that. And then I would say in terms of caring for patients, the nurses that I've worked with through the years probably taught me as much or more as the physicians I've worked with. It's been wonderful to watch how nurses are trained, how they work, how they care for patients, and contrast that with the way physicians have been trained, at least in the past. Uh, so I think I, I've, they've been wonderful mentors, and I can think of a couple in particular that had a huge impact. That's great. And then I should mention one more thing. This was this is really fun. So my last three years as CEO at Aurora, I had a um, millennial advisory group. I wanted to really get inside the heads of people who were emerging in our organization and had often different priorities um, about what they wanted to see our organization do socially, how they felt about work, how we can create a better workplace. So this was a group of about 15 people that I met with on a regular basis. 
And they had a big influence on the um, Aurora strategic plan and how we were approached many things. Um, it was probably a bit of two-way mentoring, but they were really, they were great mentors to me. And, you know, my proudest moment was they made me an honorary millennial. And <laughs> at my age, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that's really, that's really cool. Not, not to be part of the millennials, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really, it was, it was yeah. incredibly instructive just to sit and listen. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, that kind of leads me to my next question about kind of how, how medicine has changed, how providers have changed. Um, you know, what, what are you. What are you maybe not so jazzed about had that, sure. that has developed over time and what are you hopeful for? Well, I probably am more on the hopeful side and, and that's, I, I think that's just my nature, but I, I know I've listened to people through the years complain about all the changes in medicine. But my belief is when I walk into a room with a patient or families, the principles that were important to me when I was in private practice in a small town 30 years ago are no different than they are today. It's about the interaction with patients. So while a lot of things have changed around that, I think if we keep our focus on our patients and the team of people that take care of them, I don't think it's changed that much. And in fact, I think in many ways it's gotten better. My attraction to palliative care is partly around the fact that it is actually a multidisciplinary team. So hard to find in medicine years ago, um, hard to teach in a way, but one of the things I do now is I teach medical students and fellows is to say, this is a real team. We have a real team of nurses, social workers, chaplains, physicians, and others that are taking great care of patients. So I think that core fundamental part of healthcare is the same. What has changed is actually, a, it's a lot safer environment. When I enter a medication now in the EMR, I have that added benefit of somebody doing a, a cross check to make sure that I don't have two medicines that are, don't interact well, or that I haven't prescribed something that a patient's allergic to. So I think if we objectively look at healthcare at medicine, it is much safer than it was a generation ago. It is much more evidence-based. Um, and I think if we flip it around and say, is it, is it better for patients now or not? I think it's safer for patients. Um, I think it is sometimes less personal, but if we design systems right, it can be equally as personal as it was a generation ago. That's actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately is the systems, because I think in talking with patients and families, a lot, a lot of people are really happy with the care they're getting. They feel like they're, they're, you know, getting attention and all of those things. And the process of the system is the part that they may have issue with and may come to you and say, I'm having, a, you know, I can't believe I can't get this done and this done. Right. And so often I feel stuck because, you know, part of me wants to say, you're right. <laughs> but, and there's no great answers. So I think on a, I'm kind of interested about your work as far as access and, and kind of that system stuff, because just, just recently, I feel like I've had a lot of those discussions with patients about system level kind of barriers. Right. And when I say system, I mean like global health care system. Right. Um, healthcare in general. So yeah. just a, a couple of thoughts about that. Um, for those who don't like the electronic medical record, I'm, I'm a big believer. So we have Epic because of me, I, you know, <laughs> good or bad. But as a user, I like it. And I'll, the reason I like it is that virtually every patient now in Wisconsin is on Epic. And when we get referrals or send referrals, as clinicians now, we can look at that chart and really understand the patient's needs before they even get there. And I, 
I think that's a huge advantage to patients. We're not asking them to repeat what they have said a hundred times. We're not asking them to bring in a bag of medicines to their visit because we can see what they're on. So I think in, in, in that way, access is actually better and safer for patients. What I, where I think we just have some barriers is what patients need or want and what we can always offer. There's always a gap. And I learned that very clearly in my first year in rural practice, that the way I was trained or the way we think about medicine, the way patients think about it is very different. So I don't think we've yet figured out quite how to meet people where they are. We're doing some things that I think are great um, across the country. And, and you know, at, at Advocate Aurora, for example, the Live Well app, I think is a big advantage. And I understand there are some patients who may not do well with that, but my gosh, to be able to message your physician so easily, get an appointment so easily, I think that those things are a big advantage. So I have hope that we'll get better at that. My disappointment is um, I don't think we've fully or adequately developed telemedicine. I think there are a lot more opportunities and I think and patients are telling us that. Um, and then the work I'm doing now at the Center for Health Education and Access is really about um, recruiting, um, training, and placing physicians in rural and urban underserved communities. And, and my belief is that that will not happen unless we're intentional. So I'm working with two medical schools in the Western US. We're creating a campus in Florida, hopefully one in the Midwest. We have a very high percent of underrepresented minorities in the medical schools. And in this case, um, based on where people come from, it's largely um, Native American and um, Latinx patients. So we have, or um, medical students. So we have, we're, we're creating a pipeline and then we're training those students in health systems where they can be exposed to underserved areas. So it's really, I believe about getting the doctors or the services or, or the access to where patients need them, that it's not so easy. That's great. And it, I mean, I think that crosses the lines from healthcare to education to all sorts of things where people want to feel like they're represented and cared for by professionals who look like them. I Correct. That's important. That's and really cool. We've failed pretty miserably at that in the last generation. When you look at medical school statistics and long-term placement of, of students. So I'm, I'm hopeful that over time, we're gonna have um, really good success. You know, one, one of the things that I enjoy very much at Zilber is working with uh, Triumph students. That model was something we established a number of years ago with UW and it, it's really a pleasure to see students placed who have a clear interest in working in urban underserved areas and, and having the opportunity to train them and talk to them about that. Can you talk a little bit about that program? Because I know, I know, you know, at Luke's here, we know a bit about it. Um, yes. Just a little overview of what that is. Sure, there, there's one, there is a, an urban program and a rural program that Aurora and UW Medical School established a number of years ago. So the, the Triumph program in, in downtown Milwaukee places students at mainly Aurora sites for their last two years of medical school. Um, they are mainly in underserved areas. They all have a community project that they complete, which really gets them in touch with the patients that they're taking care of. Uh, and then they have various experiences, including um, rotating for a period of time at Silver. Um, so I, I get to talk about why they, should, they might want to think go, about going into palliative care after, after their next step of training. So it, it's a very um, intentional program. It's been a number of years. It's one of those pipeline programs that is now working because some of those uh, people that were students early on are now practicing in urban and rural underserved areas. So I, I think pipelines have to be intentional to be effective and to get the get doctors to where they're needed. And my next, my next level of that project is 
trying to um, perhaps get a nursing school as well. That's great. Um, I definitely want to be able to open open up to questions, but I would definitely want to know a little bit about outside of medicine. You know, what what's something for a palliative care provider, an aspect of life outside of work that might help with being a being a better palliative clinician? Um, you know, it's such an individual question for me. It's about, um, it's about getting in touch with nature. Marty and I were talking about gardening before we started today. So uh, seeing things live and grow and harvest them, uh, walking, uh, we do a lot of walking and running with our dogs. I, I love being outdoors. That is where I think about how I can make a difference in the world. So it's, a, it's I think it's about being thoughtful um, and, I actually think being in palliative care has given me a chance to talk about that work with family and friends who maybe didn't know as much about it before. You know, I, I so many times I have people say, oh, how can you do that work? That's so hard or it's so noble. And it's a chance to say, no, this, this is, we all have our niche and dying is part of what happens to us in this life. And this is about making that better. So I think it's a chance to educate people. And if, if I could do one thing for the future of palliative care, it would be to try to take some of the stigma away about uh, how early we involve palliative care, how we talk to people about dying. And um, you know, the, the more we all go out and talk about that, the more we can influence people in this world. Yes, absolutely. Well, I'd love to open this up to any questions that anyone has for you. I know in the chat, Jerry had a comment um, that he's been struggling a bit, or maybe more than a bit, with a sense of meaning and purpose in healthcare and healthcare systems. Your remarks have been a tremendous shot in the arm and rejuvenating for me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, you have a question. I see your little hand there. <laughs> Okay. Hi. I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really excited that you're uh, attending this and um, I'm not even sure where to start with questions, but I think I'll just go with the first thing I jotted down. And that's kind of the perspective that you shared about what brought you into the specialty or, you know, it sounds like you had personal and formative experiences during training. And as we see medicine become more and more specialized, and palliative is now an established specialty where we take care of people towards the end of their lives. How do you, once you finish medical school and residency training, do you feel like it's, how do you keep, or how do you train and motivate hospitalists, primary care physicians to take an interest in end of life care when, um, if they didn't get enough experience or exposure to it during medical school, is it too late? I'm just wondering your perspectives on how to grow that interest or primary palliative care skill set? Yeah, T a tough question because there are, there are so many variables that impact that. I, I do believe, um, and with the two medical schools that I'm involved with, I'm really helping them to establish a better palliative care curriculum so that this becomes part of what people are exposed to. I think anything that we can do to have more of our um, primary care residents experience palliative care in a positive way during their training increases the likelihood that they may enter the field or, or just that they'll do a better job um, as palliative physicians. Um, the other thing though is I've been interested in watching the interviews the last two years for fellows who are going into palliative care. And I find it interesting to see how many of the people that enter palliative care as a fellowship are at least mid-career, perhaps later in the career, because I think for some people, it takes a degree of maturity and a number of years of practice before they are comfortable with the dying process for patients. So I feel like it's never too late to educate 
docs and it, it, maybe we're, we would be better with a mid-career focus and getting people more interested in what we do and when to refer. How do you, how do you maintain so much optimism and hope over so many decades of practice? I feel like medicine grinds people down over time. Well, I think I've been extraordinarily fortunate and um, the ability to do many different things over the years and not do any of them for my whole career has probably allowed me to stay fresher in my, in my thoughts about it. If I had been, mm. if I had stayed in a small town and done family medicine for my entire career, it probably would have been difficult to maintain the optimism because I think the repetition in what we do, sometimes there's comfort in it, but it's also, it, it drags people down a bit. And I, I would hope that over time, we find ways for physicians who are not feeling enthusiastic about what they do to take a different path. Um, and that there, there are many paths people can take, but Sometimes I think people need a change and that's difficult when it's threatening your income and, you know, threatening your stability. But ultimately, if we want to keep people in the profession for their whole career and really engaged, I think a lot of people need a change at some point. Thank you. Tim Polly has a question. Is there something from the millennial group that still impacts your thinking that you wish we all knew? <laughs> oh, um, th there were two things that stuck out. Um, the absolute commitment to um, community service and the desire for employers to create a path to allow community service, that came up at virtually every meeting. Um, the other thing that has been written about a great deal and came through with the group is uh, flexibility flexibility in time, work-life balance, willingness to uh, sacrifice a bit on the financial or salary side to have more freedom and more family time. Um, I hope in healthcare that we continue to adapt and develop because we have been a pretty in the box profession. Um, for a long time, we didn't really understand how to do part-time for physicians or for nurses and we have to get better at that uh, and I, th I think that's one of the things that I heard from the millennial group that has stuck with me and I believe to be really true if if we want to do well as a system any employer doesn't matter what field then we better figure out how to meet millennial employees where they are just like we meet patients where they are and and think of employment in that way All good advice. Any other questions, comments? Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, it was really fun to talk with you and thanks for giving us your time today. It's a uh, pleasure. Yeah, this was really fun. Absolutely, thank you very much. All right, take care everybody, have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.